Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to celebrate this thing called art. Electric word art, it means... Well, let's find that out together, shall we? One episode at a time. The inaugural episode of Art Wonderful starts in four, three, two... Hello, art lovers, and welcome to episode one of Art Wonderful, the art podcast where art is a religion. I'm your host, Nicholas Harper. I'm broadcasting from my art studio deep within the Rogue Buddha Art Gallery. That's in the heart of the Northeast Arts District in Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's in the middle of the country on the mighty Mississippi River. I don't know why you needed to know that. Well, if you didn't know where Minneapolis was, then I guess you did need to know that. And now you know. I want to thank you for joining me as we explore everything the arts have to offer. It's the mission of this podcast to spread the gospel of the arts, their essential value to our everyday lives, and to offer a deep dive exploration into this, a most mysterious of subjects. You can learn more about myself, the Rogue Buddha Gallery, this podcast, and those we have on the show by visiting us online at roguebuddha.com. Click podcast from the menu. And be sure to listen to the end of this and each and every episode as I'll share my pick of what art event you simply can't miss should you find yourself in our neck of the woods here in the lovely Twin Cities. This is brought to you by our amazing partner, we art enthusiasts simply can't live without, MPLSArt.com. For this first episode, I thought it would be fitting, as we're embarking on a new journey together, to share a little bit about where my professional art journey began some 25 years ago. While my journey into the arts really originated as a child, As it does with most artists, it wasn't until high school and college that I began to get serious about art. Although, I wouldn't call myself an artist per se, nor consider this as my profession, until a couple years out of college. But it was while in college that I first really began to paint on the regular, despite having a crazy schedule between classes, sports, and working full-time to help pay for them their classes. One would think that I was up to my ears in art courses, but one would be wrong. While I did take a few art classes, I found them, well, sadly, rather lacking. See, I wanted to paint like Michelangelo and Da Vinci and Vermeer, and the University of Minnesota just wasn't equipped to teach the skills necessary to do that, at least not at the time that I went there. Rather than learning anatomy and how to translate the contours of the human face into two dimensions, we were told to, and I quote, draw something in brown. Literally, that was a lesson in a drawing two class at a university level. If things weren't bad enough, we had to do so, draw something in brown, while listening to the same Bob Dylan tape over and over the entire semester. Now, I'm not going to diss Bob, but he simply isn't my favorite. And having to listen to the same 10 songs while drawing things in brown, well, that's just not my bag. Needless to say, after taking three courses all of a similar ilk, I decided that an art degree was not in store for me, at least not from this institution. I did end up graduating from the U of M, although my degree was in retail merchandising and business with a minor in clothing design but that's a different episode altogether. I did finally learn how to draw the human figure. That is, in a way, I think it should be taught to any aspiring artist. But that was after college and at two private art studios, the Atelier Lac and the Bougie Studio. Although I wasn't painting on campus after my freshman year, I was using their facilities to build stretchers and canvases, which I hauled back to my mom's house. I had cleared out a room in her basement a room that was no stranger to moisture and doubled as a breeding ground for centipedes. Fresh paint on the walls, additional lighting, and a radio that I could play the music I wanted to hear, and my first studio was born. It was here that I spent many a late night in college, working away on artwork that, ironically, didn't look anything like Vermeer or Michelangelo or Da Vinci. 
nor that it even tried to look like any of those. It was sort of a hodgepodge of pop art and cubism, and I really don't know what you would call it other than it wasn't good. But I was proud of it nonetheless, and proud to sign my name on the front of each canvas. Okay, not my real name, my fake name. Yep, I had a moniker back then, and it was the number seven. Don't ask. Strangely enough, about three or four months into using that that name, uh, the TV show Seinfeld aired an episode in which George Costanza wanted to name his child the same thing, the number seven, after the jersey of his favorite baseball player. It was no matter, though, as the number seven didn't last too long on my canvases. And in case you're wondering what it was I was choosing to listen to in lieu of Bob, well, I had discovered a late night radio show perfectly situated to cater to my, shall we say, conspiratorial tendencies. It was called Coast to Coast and was hosted by the legendary Art Bell. The timing of this auditory discovery couldn't have been any better either, as my favorite magazine, Omni, was no longer being published, and my mind was eager for all things paranormal, conspiracy, alternative history, and the like. But I digress. One of my favorite coffee shops in those days was Espresso Royale, which sat in the middle of Dinkytown, a bustling neighborhood on the university campus. It was there I would caffeinate and study late at night before heading home to smush centipedes and start in on a canvas. As all good coffee shops do, there was art on the walls at the Royale and in steady month-long rotations. While I had been frequenting the coffee shop for about three years, I had never considered putting my art on the walls, perhaps thinking it wasn't good enough. But for whatever reason, that changed, and I began to build a body of work in the hopes that it would soon adorn the cafe's natural brick walls. I remember vividly the day I asked if I could show my work. It was a hot summer day. The front door of the coffee shop was open, and a regular breeze offered some relief from the heat. School was out, so Dinkytown was operating at a low hum in comparison to its busied flurry as when school was in session. I sat at the coffee table for some time, taking turns from trying to read my book and practicing what I was going to say to the guy behind the bar. I didn't think I would be nervous to ask about hanging some art on the wall at a coffee shop, but as it turns out, I was. My palms were actually sweaty as I approached. I had seen the barista a few times before, but didn't really know him as I was there mostly late at night, not during their day shift. I introduced myself and inquired about showing, and after only a couple of minutes, I walked away from the bar with a fresh cup of coffee, black, no cream, cream just breaks the coffee, and an exhibit slated for that November. Holy hell on a cow and a smushed centipede. You could color me excited. Oh, and on a side note, the barista, his name was John Nelson. I didn't know it then, but he was an artist too. Assemblage. Or, as fancy people might say, assemblage. He also made music. Also, assemblage. And had a radio show called Some Assembly Required that aired weekly on Radio K. About five years later... John would exhibit his work at my new gallery, the Rogue Buddha. He would become a regular fixture and favorite of the gallery, and also a terrific friend. The day of my art opening was frantic. That's the opening at Espresso Royale I'm talking about. You might find that strange to say art opening at a coffee shop. Not many places do that, or at least they didn't back then. Usually, when showing at a cafe, you brought your work, you hung it, and then you left. A month or two later, you came back, and you took your work off the walls, and then you left. Yeah, that's not my style. If I was going to put my work on the walls, I was going to have a to-do of sorts. And so I asked if it would be alright if I held an opening reception. While a bit puzzled, the staff was cool with it, and I set plans in motion, making sure to invite my family and friends and make a couple hundred flyers to plaster the U of M campus with. The install day was also the day of the opening reception. I believe it was November 16th, if my memory serves correctly. 
It was an early winter of sorts and was wet and snowy as I arrived at the coffee shop at one in the afternoon to install the work. Rather awkwardly, I maneuvered around those that sat at tables, trying to study for their summer classes or just read a book in silence or have a conversation. Measuring, nailing, hanging, and leveling, I got the show hung in no time. After which, I made my way around Dinky Town and the campus, plastering every telephone pole I could with a flyer for the big show. And after that, I was en route to Litton Paper Supply in downtown Minneapolis, where I would procure tablecloths, candles, and confetti to adorn each of the cafe tables later that night. And again, the staff would be puzzled, but happy to see the place look so, mm, call it classy? Another stop at the flower shop for a fresh bouquet, and I was heading back to the coffee shop to decorate. I had one more errand to run before the start time of 7 p.m. rolled around. A quick trip to Dayton's in downtown Minneapolis to procure myself a nice shirt for the occasion. As it was snowing, at a good rate now, and also rush hour, this quick trip from Dinkytown to downtown took a considerably longer amount of time than I anticipated. The fact that my vehicle wasn't the best suited for inclement weather, it being a 1974 Super Beetle, candy apple green with an Aztec sundial I had painted on the headliner, well, that didn't help matters either. After struggling to find a parking spot and hurdling snowbanks, I found myself rushing around and running through Dayton's looking for that perfect shirt. It presented itself fairly quickly, being a velvet corduroy, black of course, and I again found myself rushing, this time to the car and then rushing at a snail's pace through the snow back to Dinkytown, where I changed clothes in my VW Beetle and made my way into the coffee shop, arriving just as the first guests had begun to arrive that being my mother and my sister. Darting around, I quickly lit the candles at each table, made sure the tablecloths were aligned and that each had the correct amount of confetti properly and eloquently dispersed in the middle of each table. The staff was kind enough to prepare beverages for the guests, hot apple cider and a big urn of coffee, all gratis. My first art opening was open. Throughout the night, a number of my friends and some family came through the coffee shop. There were even a few strangers that came in after seeing one of my numerous flyers I had pasted around the neighborhood earlier that day. We talked about the art over hot coffee and apple cider and made our way through the coffee shop to look at each piece, awkwardly standing near or around people who were obviously there not for the opening but for the coffee and a place to do their homework or reading. I was so busy being excited and nervous and trying to talk to everyone that I forgot to be nervous about selling anything. I, of course, had high hopes of a sellout show, but as the night flew by and it was time to blow out the candles and sweep up the confetti from atop the plastic cloths, I didn't notice or really even care that I hadn't sold a single piece. That realization wouldn't come until the next day. But even then, I didn't care. I still had a glow from the night before. It would be some time before I would ever know that glow, the one that comes from selling your art. But the glow I had, well, this one was pretty amazing in so many ways. It was awash with pure joy and nervousness and excitement and gratitude. The buzz lasted a few days. I guess you could say it had the effect of a drug. Not that I know what that's like, but... If only there was a way to get this fix again. And that's when my attention turned to the Purple Onion, another coffee shop in Dinkytown. So there's that. There you have it. A little story about my first art opening 25 years ago at Espresso Royale in Dinkytown. Now, to be completely honest with you, the thrill of that first show, that can never be matched. I've had a lot of first thrills since then. My first exhibit in the Rogue Buddha Gallery, for instance. My first exhibit in a gallery that wasn't my own. My first exhibit out of state. First time having a painting purchased for the permanent collection of a French museum. Well, only time having a piece purchased for a permanent collection. 
let alone a French museum. Well, foundation, to be more accurate. And I'm still very much looking forward to a lot of firsts in the future, like my first solo exhibit in a museum, or the first time the Louvre calls and says, hey, Nick, we'd like to buy one of your pieces. Hey, Louvre, if you're listening, call me. But none of my other firsts, past or future, will ever quite match up to that little opening at Espresso Royale. Now, don't get me wrong, I've, I can remember the details of pretty much every opening I've ever had, as I'm always amazed to be in that type of a situation in the first place. I truly feel blessed and grateful and try and take in as much as I can, as I don't want to take any exhibit for granted or the fact that my work maybe has the potential to touch someone's soul, and then I'm there offering my soul on display, saying, hey, I'm one of you. We're from the same place. We're in this together. While that's true, ultimately all those shows that came after, they just don't hold as strong of an emotional punch, if you will. Maybe it could be compared to that first time someone smiles at you, and you notice there's something different about their eyes and the way their smile penetrates your heart. Your first time falling in love or that first handhold or kiss. Perhaps I'm just being overly sentimental. I tend to do that. But then again, what's the purpose of love or the purpose of art or the purpose of life for that matter if we can't be a bit sentimental about it? After all, we're only here once. Perhaps for me, the sentimentality is a way of letting myself know that it was important. My being here. My doing things that others were involved and that I shared myself with others and they shared themselves with me and that I didn't take any of it for granted and really that I'm just glad to have been here in the first place and, well, had my chance at bat. I am especially glad for those quote-unquote little things like coffee shop art exhibits because when it's all said and done, perhaps it's those little things and those little shows on coffee shop walls that, well, they mean the most. And looking back, you realize that they were the biggest shows of all. But then again, maybe I'm just being a bit too sentimental. Oh, hey, speaking of little art openings, there's one you should check out this weekend. Whether you're a local or visiting from out of town, I have a suggestion on a show you simply cannot miss. Now, As this is the first episode I'm publishing of Art Wonderful, and it happens to be coming out the week of an art opening at the Rogue Buddha, well, I hope you'll forgive me if I give a little shameless plug to the show we're opening on Friday night, February 14th from 7 to 11 p.m. That's right, it's Valentine's Day, and we have an amazing exhibit lined up for you called Unloved Creatures 2020. This is a mutation of the wildly successful 2019 show, at the Rogue Buddha Gallery, called Unloved Creatures. Eli Libson, Alex Kuno, Heather Renault, and John Sauer, the original core four, as I call them, are back, and the creativity and energy are doubled with four more artists added to the mix, each one invited by those original four, Angel Hawari, DC Ice, Kao Li Tao, and Jesse McNally. Again, that's Friday the 14th, Valentine's, from 7 to 11 p.m., This is a free opening, and you can find out more online at roguebuddha.com. Now, rest assured, subsequent episodes will not be so flagrantly self-promoting by way of art opening. This was just pure happenstance that I'm launching this podcast the week of the opening. In fact, in the next episode, after I talk a bit about my philosophy towards art, I'll be highlighting another exhibit which will also be opening on Valentine's Day. But you're going to have to listen to the end of the next episode when I give my suggestion of the week to hear about that one. If you want to find out about more exhibits and events you simply can't miss, be sure to head over to mplsart.com. That's mplsart.com. They have a passion for sharing the talents of our fair twin cities like none other, and their directory of galleries and events its unsurpassed. So be sure to check out mplsart.com. I also want to give a quick shout out to Jay O'Neill, aka Boxy Mouse, aka one of the hardest working artists I know. 
I'd like to thank him for lending me this gear, i.e. the microphone I'm speaking into at this very moment, and for his support in making this podcast come to fruition. I'm hoping he'll be a regular fixture on this podcast as we spend many a Friday evening already bantering endlessly on the various topics which will find themselves housed quite comfortably here on Art Wonderful. You can find out more about him at BoxyMouse.com. My first artist conversation, however, will be with legendary art guru Dougie Padilla, and that will be in episode three. But that's it for this, the inaugural episode of Art Wonderful. Hey, look, Mom, I'm on the internet. Coming to you again from deep inside the Rogue Buddha Gallery. I want to thank you for joining me, and I hope you do so again and often. Until next time, remember, the best life is the creative life, and the best self is the artistic self. Cheers. Look, Mom, I made it onto the internet. Really? Wow. I have to make sure to edit that out. And we are outie.